I have also been very forgetful. I like to put on closed captionings. If I ever forget again, please just uh, let me know, raise your hand. Um, I like closed captionings. I think it makes it a little bit more accessible for everybody. All right, so we're talking about soils being weathered or um, soils being formed when solid rock is weathered or broken down. Okay? This can be through physical weathering, chemical weathering, or biotic weathering. Okay? In all of these cases, and I'll define these definitions in the next few slides here, right, solid rock is going to be broken down, and in the meantime, it's going to release nutrients right, that can be utilized by plants and other organisms, right, as well as provide that medium, what we think of typically as that, that soil, that green soil for plants and other organisms to utilize. So if we think about physical weathering, right, this is physically breaking down the rock. Um, so if you were to go outside and have a rock and you stomped on it with your foot and it broke apart into many pieces, that could be considered physical weathering, right? In nature, what's going to start breaking down rocks into smaller pieces are going to be uh, forces like wind and water, right? Slowly, over time, it's going to lead to um, erosion. Right? Uh, if you've ever been to the desert southwest, maybe you've been to some of the national parks out there, um, so like these arches that you might see in like Arches National Park, they're made by wind weathering. And the wind has slowly eroded these rocks to form these really elaborate arches out in the desert. Um, water erosion, right? That could be um, water flowing across these rocks and uh, slowly um, forming that abrasive surface that will break down that rock over time. But it could also be something called a, a, a freeze-thaw cycle. Just something we see a lot of in Minnesota because we have these winters on um, a lot of these freeze thaw cycles. So essentially what would happen in these freeze thaw cycles, where we might have a rock, and maybe that rock has a crack in it, right? Water will enter into that crack. Right? Water is going to freeze when it gets cold enough, and when the water freezes, it's going to expand. Right? That's physically going to put some strain on that rock. And that rock is going to start to drift down. And over time, right, you can break this rock into smaller and smaller pieces as you go. All right, so physical weathering, physically breaking that rock apart. All right, the next type of weathering would be chemical weathering. Right? So this would be chemical reactions that are causing these rocks to break down. One of the common ones that we see is when water mixes with CO2, it forms this carbonic acid, right, and in that reaction, it's going to start breaking apart the rock. Okay? Um, so a lot of, like, cave systems, right, where we get all these caves, is uh, the slowly, slow erosion of due to these chemical weathering, right? You ever see, like, pockets in rocks? A lot of times you see these some sort of chemical weathering, right? So big picture here, and it's not a chemistry class, I don't want to get into the chemistry too much, but it's some sort of chemical reaction that in the process causes these rocks to break down. Okay. The last type of weathering that we will talk about is biotic weathering. Right? And this is where um, organisms are doing the breakdown. Right? Typically this is going to be plants or lichens, so I have some lichen on the top here. Right. They will typically utilize any cracks or fissures in those rocks, they throw those roots down into those cracks, and slowly break them apart over time. Right. Animals can do the same thing. Maybe they're burrowing animals, and um, they have to break down some sort of area to live in. Right. I think of plants and um, other plant-like organisms being the main type of biotic weathering, right? because they will break down a lot of this rock. In fact, lichen tends to be one of those organisms that will break down rock first, right? And then once that rock is broken down and there's a little bit of uh, soil from that lichen, then plants can come in and break down that rock even further, right? So biotic weathering, we have organisms doing that breakdown. All right, so that's how soil is formed. Right, but if we think back to what soil is, right, it has all those different properties. And I want to start by talking about the property of soil texture. 
right? So soil texture um, is going to depend on what type of parent material we grow up in here, right? So we have different classes of rocks. I don't know if you remember. Um, I remember in elementary school learning about like sedimentary and metamorphous, uh, metamorphic and igneous rocks, right? Those would all be different classes of rocks that could be broken down. They have different properties, uh, which can give the soil its different texture. Okay? If we look at soil texture a little bit more in depth, we're going to start to look at the soil particles, which make up that soil texture. Right? Now, when we look at soil particles, we're really looking at three major classes of soil particles. Right? This would be sand, silt, and clay. Right? And so sand is going to be the largest of the particles that you might find in soil, whereas clay is going to be the smallest of the particles. And there's many other um, mixtures of soils out there besides purely sand or purely clay. Right? And it's a combination of how um, much clay, silt, and sand is present in that soil that makes up all these other different soil types. Right? So, like a clay loam has kind of a, a solid mixture of all three. Right? If we look at something like this loamy sand, right? it has a small percentage of clay, but a high percentage of sand. Right? So, you can get these different mixtures depending on how much sand, silt, and clay. Now, if we look at these sands of the clay, right, they're going to give the soil these different properties, right? particularly in how well it can hold water and nutrients. Right? So like I mentioned, sand is the largest of the particles. And in this image here, right, you can see that these sand grains are very, very large compared to the other grains. Sand tends to have a low surface to volume ratio. So if we looked at this particle, and we looked at the surface area, right, so all that um, surface that is exposed that we can see right, from the surface of that particle, right, versus everything that's inside of that particle, which would be the volume of that particle, right, it has a lot of stuff on the inside compared to what's exposed on the outside, right, because it's a larger particle. Now this has consequences for the soil and how it might um, behave. Okay. So because it has a lower surface area, okay, or lower um, surface that we can physically see here, there's fewer sites for nutrients to basically be held onto by that soil sort of part. Okay. It also has a much lower water holding capacity, right? Which means um, the ability to keep water in the soil. Right? And sandy soil, right, when you, you know, bend to a beach, you've seen the waves come in and go back out, right, that water tends to move through the sand very quickly. Right? It, doesn't, it isn't held onto by the sand for very long. And this is due to its um, high porosity. Right? So I mentioned that word before. So if we look at this image at top here, on top here, you see that on one side we have no pore spaces, and on the other side we have these really open pore spaces. Right? So the pore spaces are like the gaps between the soil particles. Right? Now, because sand is such a large particle, right, um, it's going to have a lot of gaps between each of the particles when they're put together. So, if you think about um, if you filled up a pool with um, basketballs. Right? There's going to be a lot of space in between all those basketballs because they can't just um, mesh together very well. Right? So they would have a high porosity just like sand and because there's more gaps, right, it's not going to hold on to the water as easily. Right? The water is going to leave very quickly. Now clay on the other hand, right, clay is the smallest of the particles. So if we look at this image here, we have our sand particles, we have our silt particles here, these clay particles are really tiny, kind of yellowish dots in this image, right? They are much, much smaller. Because they are smaller, right, they're going to have a high surface to volume ratio, meaning there is more exposed on the outside of these particles than there is stuff on the inside of these particles because they are so small. 
this is going to lead it to have a very low porosity, right? So we're going to see something that um, has very any pore spaces when we're talking about clay type substances. Right? And so if it has very little about pore like spaces, sometimes it doesn't work with pore, right? That seems to be the best word I can come up with here. Um, it's going to have a really high water holding capacity, right? Once water gets into a space between these particles, Right? It's really like nowhere to go, right? Because you don't have all of these spaces for it to flow through, and it's, it's kind of all in place, right? So you can think of play as filling up a swimming pool with, instead of basketballs, um, like marbles. Right? They're going to be much more clustered in there. It's going to be much more dense. There's not going to be as many spaces in between those marbles as, say, a basketball filled pool would have. Um, because it has a lot of surface, right, it's going to be able to hold on to a lot of nutrients, right, which can be good for plants. Right? Um, and like I said, it has that high water holding capacity. So water, once it gets into that soil with a high clay content, it's going to stay into that soil for a longer amount of time. All right, so that was soil texture and soil particles, but that's not the only thing that makes up soil. Soil solution is also a part of soil. Even though it's not the particle itself, the soil solution is the uh, solution surrounding those soil particles. Most often water, right, with some dissolved nutrients and minerals. Okay. And so if we look at, say, this cartoon image of soil here, we have all these soil particles. We might have air pockets in there. And it's like water with all those dissolved nutrients surrounding those soil particles, and right, that would be the soil solution. Right? And that's important because a lot of nutrients can be dissolved in water and make it more accessible for plants to uptake into their system and the lots. Right? So soil solution is that water with dissolved substances surrounding the soil particles. All right, let's take a step back here. I like to do these in between content-heavy lectures, just to give you a chance to kind of brief what you've already learned, answer some questions, and if you don't understand anything, it's a great time to ask me one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I want you to talk to somebody around you right, and answer these two questions. What is soil and what three particles can be present in soil? That's kind of a review question here. And the soil on Mars is not technically soil. Why is this? I'll give you a couple minutes here.
All right. What is soil? What is that definition of soil? What has to be present for it to be considered soil? Yeah, it has to be biologically active. Yeah, what else? Yeah, it's on the uppermost layer of the earth. Yeah. Yeah, it has some sort of porosity to it, right? And what are those three particles that will determine how porous the soil might be? Yeah, sand, silt, and clay. So if we think about the soil on Mars, which I often call it soil because it's easier in my mind to call it soil, um, but it's not practically soil. Why is that? What is it missing? Yeah, it's not biologically active. At least from what we know, right? Um, not biologically active, so we would call it regolith instead of soil. Any questions so far? All right, we're going to charge on. So part of soil is also not only going to be the particles and the soil solution, it's going to be the soil organic so this is really that biologically active part of soil, right? It's going to be a, a layer of soil that has all that decomposing organic matter. Right? So maybe leaves that are decomposing, um, small organisms or animals that are decomposed. Right? Um, it might contain uh, leaf litter, right? Leaf litter is fallen leaves, right? That's the technical term for the leaf you find, say, on the forest floor. Uh, animal tissues, feces, uh, right? um, plant exudates, so anything that the plants might release. A um, uh, really easy one to understand would be like sap, right? Um, oftentimes it doesn't really get into the soil as much as we see it on trees, but plants will also exude other chemicals. And the biomass of microbes, right? So those small um, organisms in the soil. So, soil organic matter contains things that are biologically active. Now, soil organic matter is important for soil, right? It's going to lead to more nutrients in the soil. Right? Um, nutrient cycling is going to be the process of nutrients entering the soil, nutrients entering the plants or animal, and then once those plants or animals die, entering back into the soil. It adds some sort of a structure to the soil, right? So instead of being purely soil particles, purely clay, purely sand, right? Now we're going to introduce some sort of a structure. So maybe it's these um, broken down leaves or small twigs into the soil. Right? And a lot of these uh, decomposing organisms are going to provide energy for soil microbes. Right? And soil microbes play an important role in breaking down other pieces of organic matter to release nutrients into the soil. Okay. Soil microbes can also be um, that, that symbiosis or that, that harmony with plants and when they can exchange nutrients with each other. Okay. So soil organic matter is a critically important part of soil, which is why it is broken in the definition of what is soil. So if we think about soil organic matter, Right, we can kind of break it down into two different stages, right? One would be detritus, right? So this is the organic matter that is actively being broken down, right? So leaves are leaves that are actively decaying, right? Animal tissues that are actively rotting and decomposing, right? Um, these are going to be um, the part of the organic matter where the nutrients are being actively released by microbes into the soil. So I know I have this, well, it looks like a complicated diagram, but I'll break it down here. Right? Once we have detritus, right, this is what's something, and I'll, it's in winter, this is probably most commonly what it's going to look like, right, a bunch of dead leaves, some twigs, maybe some uh, dead insects in there, actively being broken down, right, it's being broken down um, by these consumers, these microbes, um, Maybe different predators are consuming some tissues, 
that they have found on the side of the road. Anything that is actively being broken down would be quiet. After everything is broken down, the remaining bits would be humus. Okay? So humus is uh, going to contribute to that soil structure as well as the fertility. So how nutrient rich is that soil? So after everything's broken down, what's left behind right, would be the soil humus. Now you can often think of this, um, oh, if you're composting your food scraps, right, when you see the end point of that composting, it's going to look something similar to a rich soil, right, full of uh, nutrients, full of structures, but nothing is being actively broken down. It's kind of at its, at its end point. Right, so humus is an important um, factor when we look at soil organic matter. A lot of times soil will be analyzed for how much humus is present. Right? Um, if we say a soil is humus poor, we mean that it typically has less than 1% of organic matter. Right? If it's humus rich, it doesn't have a huge amount of humus, but we say it has something over 8%. It's not like the entirety of the soil is made up with humus, but humus is present in that larger amount. Okay. Um, oftentimes, optimal growth for plants is going to be near that 8% of humus. Okay. So this is kind of that threshold level where we start to get um, soil that's going to hold on to enough water and enough um, ions, so minerals and nutrients for a healthy soil, for a healthy for plants to be able to thrive. Right, so humus, largely important. Okay. Now, like I said, humus is uh, made by the decomposition of decaying matter. Right? So made from that decomposition. So decomposition, right? The process of making that humus is going to be the breakdown of organic matter into smaller components, right? It might be as a small as ripping a leaf in half, right? And it might be even as microscopic as breaking it down into the basic constituents of that leaf, so the molecules that make up the leaf. And when we think about how fast organic matter can be broken down, there's a couple of factors we have to think about. So it's really microbes that are playing the largest role in breaking down this organic matter. And so the microbes are going to be affected by what type of organic matter is being broken down. Right? Plants, especially, tend to have um, these molecules in them that are very tough and hard to break down. So cellulose being one of them, um, lignans being another one, um, they're really hard to break down for most organisms. So they're going to take longer to break down than something, say, like decomposing insects or a, a decomposing rodent or some sort of animal, right? Plants are hard to break down. Um, but also we have to look at the rate of the soil microbe activity. Right? If these microbes, these microscopic organisms, are really active, right, they can break stuff down faster. If they're not active, it's going to take longer. And if you look at what is going to influence that microbe activity, it's really going to be the amount of water present and the amount of carbon. Right? So organic carbon tends to be their food source. Um, organic carbon is going to be found in those decaying um, plant matter, decaying animal flesh. Right? That's where they're going to get their source of organic carbon. Right? But they also need water to survive. It's like we need water. Right? These microbes also need water uh, to maintain their metabolism and keep them um, going. So if we think about areas that might be arid or really dry right, and don't produce a lot of um, plants or organisms, so low productivity and then grow slower, um, they're often going to have really low rates of microbial activity right, because A, there's not a lot of water in these dry places, and B, because things are growing more slowly and there's less of it growing, there's less organic matter. Those are the biggest two factors that affect microbial activity. In Minnesota here, there tends to be plenty of organic matter, plenty of water. 
right? So we tend to have uh, faster rates of decomposition than, say, someplace like the desert southwest. All right, so I want to do another review, right? What's going to affect the rate of decomposition? And then I want you to think about this scenario where we might have decomposition, or I should say, would decomposition occur more slowly or quickly in a desert that receives little rainfall and contains vegetation with tough, protected seeds, than a grassland that receives abundant precipitation and fast growing vegetation with very thin, less defended seeds. All right, let's bring it back together here. Um, what two factors are going to affect the rate of decomposition? Yeah, what's the organic compound that's made of? Um, and what else? The activity of the microbes, which could be affected by what they're breaking down, and also how much water is available to them, right? Yeah. So in our scenario here, we have these uh, two different areas, right? One's in a desert with really thick, um, protected leaves. Um, when I say protected leaves, I mean typically they tend to have more cellulose, so they tend to have more like hairs on them to try to prevent insects and other critters from eating them. Right? Or an area that's more like a grassland, lots of precipitation, and uh, less dependent leaves. Which one's going to have a higher rate of decomposition? Grassland or desert? Grassland, yeah. All right, any questions on this material? All right. So we're going to continue talking about soil organic matter. Right, and talking about what might influence how much matter is available. So beyond um, like the local processes of decomposition, we're going to think more larger scale. Here, right? And I'm going to go through each of these steps here. We'll talk about uh, gains and losses of carbon, right? how the climate is going to affect um, organic matter, vegetation, how well the soil is growing, as well as agriculture. So I'm going to start with the gains and losses of carbon here. So if we're talking about gains and losses of carbon, we're really looking at carbon and how it's entering a system and leaving a system. So the imports are going to be things like soil organic matter. Right? Things that contain 
carbon, carbon-based life forms, right? That's going to input carbon into the soil, make it available for those microbes, those plants. What's going to take carbon out of the soil right, is going to be um, what we call oxidation of soil organic matter, which is basically the release of carbon dioxide and energy. Right? So this is oftentimes when microbes take in that carbon, right? but they're also going through these cellular processes, um, also going through cellular respiration to maintain their body, and they will essentially exhale CO2 back out. Right? Um, similar to what we do, right? We eat food, we eat it, we process it, we release CO2 when we do. Okay? Um, so oxidation is a major one, as well as processes like erosion, right? physically removing things from the area. And it can be eroded away. Right? And if we look at this process, right, we're typically looking at more large scale. Right? So instead of looking at um, your front yard, we might be looking at the entire county or the entire state of Minnesota. Right? And we're really going to look at, you know, is the import of organic carbon greater than what is being if there is more inputs of carbon than there is carbon leaving the system, you will have a buildup of organic matter in the soil. Okay. Um, Minnesota and most of the Midwest tend to have a lot of organic matter in the soil. We also have to think about climate. Okay. And there's a couple of different things uh, that we'll talk about with climate. The first is temperature. Temperature is going to play a major role. Okay. It's going to affect how fast um, how long the growing season is. Okay. And um, plants, right, as they grow and they die back for the winter, that die back right, is going to be inputted into the decomposition, right, putting that organic matter back into the soil. Right. So if you have a lot of plant growth, you tend to have a lot of organic matter input or carbon inputs into the system. And so we tend to see soil organic matter um, increasing as climates are cooler, right? because we tend to have a buildup of plant material, which is colder, right? Even though it's, it's kind of counterintuitive, right? You would think maybe the southern part of the U.S. would have a lot of organic matter because there's a lot of vegetation growth, a lot of input into the soil, right? But when we think about the microbes breaking down that Midwest here, right? Well, we have a decent amount of vegetation being inputted into the system. Maybe not as much as, say, um, these lower states here. Right? The microbes don't have as long to break them down, and they're exposed to cooler temperatures. Right? So they're going to be more active in warmer temperatures, less active in cooler temperatures. Not going to break down that vegetation as fast, so we're going to get more of a buildup of that organic matter. It's not going to decompose it. It's also going to play for the moisture. Right? We know organisms need moisture right? to break down um, all our decaying matter. Right? Organic matter tends to increase as moisture increases. Right? Um, and this, again, is kind of counterintuitive. And it's one of those areas of biology that's like, Organic matter will increase as moisture increases because when we have more soil being released, it's going to lead to a slower rate of decomposition. So leaching, I have this my little cartoon image here, if we have a rain coming in and the soil is fairly porous, that water is just going to go right through the system. And it's going to leave the system from the and when it leaves the system, it's actually going to take a lot of stuff with it, right? All the nutrients and minerals that have been dissolved in that water is going to leave with the water and it's out. Right? 
And because all those nutrients are being mixed up, you tend to get this buildup of the organic matter because it's not decomposing as fast. It's a little bit more of a complicated one to understand. Um, I, I've talked about this one quite a bit here so far, but vegetation is going to play a role. Right? And we know that vegetation has a tight relationship with climate. Increased precipitation, we're going to have increased plant productivity. And when I say productivity, I mean the amount of plant growth is what's actively growing. Right? And more plants leads to more sources of organic matter. And so if we look at soil organic matter, in the United States, I want to thinking about vegetation, but also those climate conditions we talked about, right? Moisture and temperature. You see that indeed we do tend to have a lot of organic matter in this upper Midwest area. Right? Where we have a decent amount of vegetation growing, but it's also a cooler climate, so things aren't as bad. Right? Um, this uh, coast area tends to have a little bit more vegetation in the too. Um, this can be um, wet and rainy and cooler conditions, uh, but a lot of growth and rainforest in this area. And, um, so, some really interesting interplays of organic matter. Right? Now, we're going to think about a little bit more locally, right, rather than an entire state or an entire country. If we think about more local factors, we can think about soil drainage. And so sandy soils are going to have less organic matter because they're going to drain a lot of the water out very quickly. Now the sandy soils, really large particles, really high porosity, which means it's not going to hold on to that water as easily. Okay? Whereas these finer texture soils, like clay or silk, or it has that higher, or excuse me, lower, it's going to hold on to the water a little bit more easily to stay in the soil longer. And when water stays in the soil longer, it's going to promote plant productivity. The water is available for those plants because it's sticking around. Um, and these finer texture soils, because they have all that lower porosity, and because that water is not leaving, they have a little more drainage. Um, so it's going to restrict drainage. We don't need to build up over organic matter. I have this little image here where you can see uh, kind of this cartoon ish drawing of a well drained soil and a very poorly drained soil. And this top little layer here represents the soil organic matter. And you see in the poorly drained soil, we have more of a build up of that soil organic matter rather than the entire well. And again, the water's not being held there, so organisms. Plants in particular can't really utilize it. The last one I want to talk about is agriculture. Right? So again, we're looking more at uh, more of a local scale here. And agriculture, rockland tends to have less soil organic matter, even though they're very productive areas, but they're actively growing a lot of plants. Right? Those plants are being harvested, though, and being taken away from that area. And so there's not a lot of import back into the soil. Now we're using those nutrients in the soil to grow our crops. The crops are harvested, they're carried off somewhere else, right? Those nutrients are not going back into the soil. Right? So they have lower organic matter, which is often why, um, especially in Minnesota, maybe um, this past fall you smelled it in the air, um, we would spread compost and manure onto these fields to give it more organic matter because we have taken so much away. Right. Um, we also have tillage, right? So when we till the soil, um, we, um, I don't even know how to describe tillage of the soil. When we turn up the soil, there we go. We move that soil around, right? Uh, we're gonna aerate, we're gonna introduce more air pockets into the soil. Um, that does allow for some factor decomposition, right, which will increase the amount of organic matter, right, because it's keeping away with that. All right, so soils in general, really important for plants, right? Plants need water and nutrients. Soils hold water and nutrients. Right? 
Um, but soils can limit what plants grow where because soils are very diverse. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the rock component of today. Right? That some soils don't have a lot of nutrients and aren't able to hold on to water as well. And so only certain plants are adapted to live in those very uh, rough environments. Right? Um, so things like moisture, right? things like nutrients, but also, also things like the age of the soil can affect um, plants and how they grow. If the soil is really old, I think it's been um, leached or depleted of a lot of its nutrients already. Okay, so soils really can limit plants, soils why even though plants they gotta rely on soil, right? We need soils. Alright, so last question here. I want you to look at the factors that influence the amount of soil organic matter. Okay. And if we're thinking about the US, and we're just looking at like more natural areas, right? So thinking more broadly rather than local. Where would you expect to have the highest amounts of soil organic matter and why? I did show you that map, so that could give you a clue. But then think about the why. Why is there more soil organic matter? Okay. A couple minutes to discuss. What is that would influence soil organic matter? Whole handful of them there. What is, um, what's a climate one? Yeah, temperature and moisture. What else would influence soil organic matter? Vegetation, how much? Input, right? Which brings us to another 
kind of the overarching theme here, right? How much uh, organic matter, how much carbon is being input into the system versus how much is being used. Yeah. Any other factors that? Oh, some of the local factors. Yeah, agriculture and yeah, soil drainage. All right, so if we look at the U.S., what parts of the U.S. might have really high amounts of soil organic matter? Yeah. Yeah. So the Midwest kind of area tends to have a lot of soil organic matter. Why? Yeah, yeah, things are decomposing slower, there's less time for things to decompose. Um, so you get that build up over here. That's one of the, the bigger ones here. Um, we can also throw vegetation into the mixture, right? How much vegetation is actually growing, right? There's the interplay of all these different factors on one another. Any questions? All right, I'm going to skip through to homework, um, and then we'll, we'll take a break and uh, do the last one. Uh, so homework, finalized um, brainstorm, or finalized decision to what you'd like to do. We'll be doing class on Monday, and we will talk about this together, um, go through it. Like I said, I'm going to do my best to randomize it so that I'm um, getting equal fairness and getting their top pick. Uh, so that'll be due in class uh, on Monday. The brainstorm I said was due tonight. I realized on Google it's actually supposed to be due to tomorrow. Put it into me before Monday. That's quite bad. Um, Monday, also another a quiz. Um, there's a couple things for you to, well, one thing for you to watch, one thing for you to listen. And one thing you listen to is a podcast. It is fairly lengthy. If you want to listen to the whole thing, great. Right? You want to focus on the part that I'm going to quiz you on, start at the 9 minute 40 second mark, right? Um, and then don't forget to endurance. If you have some time over the weekend, read those first five chapters. Um, and don't forget to check your Let's see if I have anything else to add to that. Don't believe I do. All right. Let's, uh, well, let's take a 15 minute break. Uh, we'll meet down in the lab space at around a little after 11.45, 11.46, 11.47, somewhere in there would be about 15 minutes. <laughs>